welcome to Waters Garden Center. My name is Michelle and today's class is planting in mountain soils and how to do it well and succeed. So we're going to teach you everything you need to know about planting here. Um, how many of you guys are new to this area? Just a few. Um, so Prescott, Arizona is, has interesting characteristics. So we are a mile high, so we have very high altitude, very intense sunshine, and there's no humidity whatsoever around except for when it rains. Um, so April, usually April through June, right before the monsoons pick up, we're so dry and the wind blows out of the south all the time and it's like sustained 20 mile an hour winds. So we're very, very dry. Um, so we have that for us. Um, all the plant signs, the tags, be careful when you read these because they do make them for the entire country and not just for Prescott, Arizona. Um, so we have our areas set up. So we have shade sections and sunny sections. So don't hesitate to ask if you, you need something specifically for a certain type area. Because um, a lot of things that used to go in some sun can't handle our intense afternoon sunshine. So um, kind of take a, a perspective of your, your landscape and figure out what kind of sun and shade you have before you decide to plant because that'll eliminate some of those errors that we get. Um, the other thing is that if you guys have ever tried to dig a hole, it's almost nearly impossible. Um, so get the right tools if you're going to do it yourself or find somebody that can do it for you and make sure that they know how to do it. And so we're going to teach you exactly what you need to know to plant here. Um, so what are you guys looking at planting? Fruit trees? Gardens, anything, flowers, okay. Okay, uh, so we'll touch base on all of those um, and that way we can kind of signal in on specific things. Um, but basically when you plant here, um, you wanna dig your hole twice as wide as the bucket that it's in and just as deep. And I've got planting guides that I will hand out for you. I've got enough up here that I can hand them out to you all before you leave. Um, and it'll, it'll tell you step by step how to plant. Um, so twice as wide, just as deep. And um, when you go, all that soil that you dug out, you're going to reuse. Um, because it's got to get used to living in the stuff that it's going to be living in for the rest of its life. So you don't want to over amend it. So two thirds natural soil, one third premium mulch, and you will be set and ready to go for it to, to grow properly for you. Um, so, and that goes for your trees, your shrubs, perennials, all of that, twice as wide, just as deep. Um, hanging baskets, we'll, we'll get into it in a little bit. Um, so with, the, uh, with our soils, we have various uh, high pH, um, because of our alkalinity. Um, so we need to make sure that we are lowering that um, regularly because plants don't like high pH. Um, so if you use the um, all-purpose fertilizer, um, it actually has the sulfur in it. So that helps because we do that regularly. It will continue to keep that in a normal pattern. Um, if you are using something else as a fertilizer, you'll definitely want to put some sort of sulfur on your plants so it takes care of that situation. Um, so when you're digging your hole, if you are new to your particular area, I suggest to dig one hole, fill it up with water and just see how your drainage is. Um, we call it a perk test. Um, they'll do it for your septic tanks and all that stuff because they do want that all to drain. Um, but it'll tell you whether you have good drainage or bad drainage. So good drainage is if the water is gone within four hours. Um, so, so drainage, if it's okay, 
it's okay to plant if it's eight, but you're going to probably water less with that situation. If it is still there after eight hours, you don't want to plant a tree there um, because it'll probably die of root rot. Um, they just need drainage. So there's ways of getting around that. You can plant on berms um, or higher up um, just to increase that drainage. Um, you can also sink holes on each side of your trees um, with a drill or an, an auger just to get past that uh, caliche layer, um, just so you have drainage holes in that spot. And sometimes that'll work for you as well. Um, so make sure you have decent drainage. Um, and kind of pay attention to your soil as well because that's gonna help you with the watering. Um, we, we do recommend watering once or twice a week but it's gonna depend on if you have heavy clay soils, you might only have to water once a week. Um, if you have very well-drained soil and it, it's very rocky and sandy and it drains really quickly, you might have to water a little bit more often than some of us, uh, some other folks. So usually that's what we see as far as issues with plants. So it's, it's I can't just say, this is what you're gonna do. We're gonna to have to play with it. Um, use your fingers or get a, a moisture meter. Those will help. Um, think of it as a cake. If you put your finger in and your finger comes out dirty, it, it doesn't need water. If it comes out clean, you need to water. So just kind of think of it as baking. Okay, so another thing that will help um, the, the premium mulch is organic material that we're going to add to the soil. It does two things. If you have very sandy soil, it will help give you some moisture holding power. If you have very heavy clay soil, it actually breaks up that clay and gives you uh, air for it to breathe in there. So water can go through and drain better. Um, so um, you definitely want to use it for two reasons. We do offer a warranty on all our trees, plants, shrubs, and perennials. Um, so if you buy mulch with our uh, plant materials, we give you a two-year 50-50 warranty on, on the plant. So we go halves on the cost. So if anything happens, just let us know and we can try to work what happened, you know, what's going on and, and try to figure out what's going on. Like I said, it's usually a water issue, um, but sometimes there's bugs or gophers or things like that. Um, so we want to help you succeed and that's what we're here for. Um, for, for those people that have uh, heavy clay soil, we do recommend that you put gypsum in the bottom of the hole when you go to plant. It help and helps open up the pores of the soil so water can get down in there. Um, gypsum is actually also good for tomatoes um, because tomatoes um, need the calcium so you don't get that blossom end rot the black stuff that shows up on the bottom of the tomatoes all the time, or if you've had squash that start coming out and then they kind of just shrivel up at the end, that's blossom and run on squash. Um, so if you are getting vegetable gardens together, putting the, the either the gypsum or the calcium nitrate in there now will help get your beds ready for your tomatoes, peppers, and that type of thing. And it works better for drainage. Sulfur. Um, I kind of touched base on this earlier, um, but the sulfur helps our lower the pH in our soil um, along with the fertilizer. Um, so we, because of our soil, so it's basically dead. There's no nutrients whatsoever except for some iron that they, the, because of the high pH, the anything can't take it in. Um, so we need to feed. Um, so we feed this regularly. Um, we have two different types of fertilizers. We have our fruit, uh, the all purpose, which is good for everything that's in your garden. Um, and then we actually have a fruit and vegetable one that's specifically for that. Um, basically the difference is that the 
uh, fruit and vegetable does not have the sulfur in it. Um, and also the this doesn't have the calcium in the, as the fruit and vegetable does. Um, so sulfur is very important. Um, if you guys have a shady garden, you definitely want to add sulfur to your hydrangeas, your rhododendrons, all of that shady stuff needs that extra sulfur. It likes that more neutral acidity. So you want to really be careful with that. Um, the sulfur also makes your colors more bright. Um, the aluminum sulfate will actually make your blue spruces even bluer. Um, so we usually put that on in the fall. Yes, you can. Um, hydrangeas, you can plant here in Prescott. Um, they are a shady plant, um, so they, they can take some morning sun. They just can't take that afternoon sun. Um, most of your, well, all of your hydrangeas will go to sticks in the wintertime, um, and then they come up from the ground. Um, so um, you definitely want to add these. It'll keep the color true. So if you buy a blue hydrangea, it'll keep your hydrangeas blue. If you buy a pink one, it'll keep that pink. If you, as the acidity goes up or the pH goes up, your colors are going to change on you. Sulfur, correct. I'm sorry? Her question was, when would you plant them? Um, I would say as soon as we get them. Um, so, but we do have some coming in next week. Um, they probably will be sticks. If not, they're not going to have a lot of leaves on them. Um, but where we get product from is the West Coast, um, Oregon, and California. So they're a little ahead of us. So things that are in bloom now in your yard are probably not blooming yet. So like your forsythias aren't blooming. Um, your fruit trees, mine are blooming. I got peaches and apricots, nectarines, they're all in bloom. Um, so when you see things here, it, mine's not doing that. It's okay. Yours are actually on time. These are just early because of where they, they came from. Um, so when you plant your tree, shrub, or whatever, um, when you backfill, we recommend that you put the fertilizer on, water it in really, really well, and then you're gonna use the root and grow. Uh, root and grow is our stress reducer. Um, it's a 211 or 221. Um, it has all sorts of good micronutrients. It smells like molasses. Um, kind of feels that way too, um, but it's really good stuff. And for your woody stuff, so your trees and shrubs, I usually use it every two weeks for six. Um, so about three times after the first planting. Um, for my fruits and vegetables, I just use it once when I first plant everything, just gets those roots going. Um, we also use this on house plants. Anytime I transplant something, I use this. Um, so it's a really great product for you. Root and grow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a month ago. <laughs> um, so his question was when to transplant. Um, you want to transplant when they're dormant. Um, so um, it, it, it takes that stress out of it. Um, however, if you need to move something from one spot to the other, do it as soon as you can um, because they haven't leafed out. So they, they're not extending so much energy on the leafing out and, and they'll put a little bit more into the root system. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, I use root and grow once in my garden. Correct. Yes. Okay, questions about any of the products that I've talked about? Okay. Humic acid is another thing that I put in my, when I first plant, and then I do it once a year. 
um, usually when I do my March feeding. Um, so we feed three times a year for our deciduous trees and shrubs, um, Easter, 4th of July, Halloween, and then we use the New Year's for, for our evergreens. Um, Easter is really late this year, but I, I do, do it now because everything's starting to leaf out and they need that energy um, to get it in there. Um, the humic acid is um, a very uh, fine uh, composted material um, that actually invites the, the mycorrhizae and the good fungi, fungi that help root systems grow. Um, I used this for the first time when I first moved in and I, I dug about 10 holes when I first got here because I actually brought plants with me um, and I didn't see an earthworm at all. After I used this, about two months later, when I started digging, it's like, ooh, there's a worm. I've got worms now. So it does do great things for, for plants. I only put this down once a year, um, so I usually do it in the springtime. Yes, and I actually apply this just like a fertilizer. So if you're putting uh, two cups, so with the fertilizer, it's two cups per inch. So if you're using two cups, I would use two cups of this and so on and so forth. Uh, for a smaller shrub, I'd probably do a cup. Yeah. Okay. That's in my treat. Pretty much I've talked about everything. So how about some show and tell? Unless anybody has questions about planting. Okay. Mm-hmm. So his question is, he's got a lot of little uh, pinion pines around his other trees. Yeah, if they're small enough, I'd say go ahead. Try to get, if he's about this big, go about this far when you go down and dig and, and kind of have a hole already prepared for when you put him in and then use the root and grow when you transplant it and he should be fine. Yeah. Um, Water as you would normally water a new plant. Um, pinions are very drought tolerant, so you, you won't probably have to water it quite so much once it gets going, just to get those roots going. Okay. All right. Let's do some show and tell. Pretty stuff. Persithias. Persithias are bloom throughout the nursery right now. Um, we have all different sizes, so it, there is one to fit in every garden. Uh, the magical gold is kind of that middle ground and it, it stays in that five by five size range. Really pretty yellow flowers. It's one of the first things to bloom early in the spring. And then it has bright lime green leaves um, for the rest of the year. Um, for Scythias and lilacs, are one of the few things that you do not prune in February and March, um, because if you do prune it, you're cutting off all your, your blooms. So you want to wait until after it's done blooming, uh, all the blooms fall off, and then you can prune it to the size that you want it to be. See, I almost forgot this. <laughs> Okay, so this is our email page uh, for all the, the added um, uh, pamphlets that we have information on this, we'll, we'll send out to you. Um, it's just for this class, so if you signed up last week, you won't get what's for this class. There you go. Yes. Uh-huh. It is. Very much so. Anything that blooms early, the bees love. Um, boxwoods, you don't really even notice that they're blooming, but boxwoods actually bloom first and, and the bees just love it. Absolutely. No one's gonna like this right now, but um, I brought a juniper up. Um, this is a mint julep juniper. Um, he is a 
basically a shrub that's going to get about six by six. It's not a sprawler, um, just a nice, great evergreen. If he needs a little bit of privacy, he gets that height and width for you to keep a little bit of that neighbor out of the, you know, you're off your patio. Um, they do not have pollen like what you've been seeing all day. If you've been watching, I, I, I keep watching the, the clouds of smoke coming across the, the, the mountains over there. Um, alligator junipers have that big, it, all the orange trees right now are the males and, and they're spreading their stuff. Um, so um, that that's what's making us itchy and watery and all of that stuff. These, all, all of these will have some pollen, but nothing compared to what's going on. Um, but this is just a great shrub. It stays this beautiful green all winter long. Um, very drought tolerant, easy to grow. This is a um, perfect purple crab apple. Um, this is one of my favorites. Um, he has um, really pretty kind of purplish foliage um, and the blossoms are just this dark, dark pink. Um, they get about 20 by 20. They're an ornamental tree. Um, their, their fruit is about a, a quarter of an inch um, and um, the birds just love them. Um, great color for fall. Um, you get the orange and, and uh, gold leaves. Uh, so it's just a really pretty smaller tree um, for, for certain situations. Mugo pines. Um, Mugo pines are one of those that kind of come in, a, a, there's different sizes. Um, they all say they're going to get about five, four or five feet. Um, there are the slow mound that kind of stays in that three foot range. They're very, very slow growers. Um, however, in 20 years, if you don't do any pruning, you could have something that's, things don't just stop growing when they get to a certain height. Um, so you can prune and, and take off the candles and that'll keep it smaller for you and you wouldn't have to cut deeply. Um, evergreen, very drought tolerant um, and they're really pretty just to have little piles, it, it, especially if you have berms and rocks things, they look really good in that situation.
Here I am. Okay, much better. <laughs> okay, so this is a potentia. Um, this one's called Mandarin Tango. Um, this starts out uh, with a really pretty dark red and orange flower. Um, it's like the yellow potentia that we're all familiar with, but it has that really pretty red uh, exterior on it. It does kind of fade to the yellow afterwards, but it, it gives you a nice, really pretty show when it's blooming. Um, potentias are deciduous, so they do um, go back to sticks in the winter. Um, but you can shape them in February, March, and they just start off right away. Um, one thing about potentias is they are very drought tolerant, but um, my they're one that really needs good soakings for about three weeks after you plant them. Um, they just can't seem to get enough water at that beginning. Um, so don't worry about overwatering. There's two plants, this one and the barberry. You can't well, you can overwater them, but you can water every couple of days and, and they would, they need that. Um, as the season goes on and we get hotter, probably every day until they get established. And you'll no, start to see when they don't actually need that extra water. So um, I don't usually tell people to go ahead and extra water. <laughs> Raspberries. So, um, Now's a good time to get fruit planted and ready to go. Um, raspberries are great. Um, they produce regularly. Um, again, twice as wide, just as deep. Um, they, they love the full sun. Um, there are some, uh, these are thorn, but there are some thornless ones over there that you don't have to worry about being prickled. Um, but I have all sorts of different varieties and, and they produce really well. Um, we also have blackberries, boysenberries, grapes. Um, there's some pomegranates over there um, along with all the different fruit trees. Her question was, will this grow in a pot? And I would say this type, it, it, they're more brambles, so they're, they're used to going very large. But there's one called uh, the baby cakes or short, raspberry shortcake over there that is a small one. It, they, they created it for containers, so that's the one I would look for. <laughs> yes. So her question was, is do, do a lot of people do container gardens? Yes, we all do container gardens. It, it's just easier that way. So yes, you can do a lot of things in containers. Um, Ken's got a fruit tree in a large, one of our huge pots. He just keeps it pruned and it, it produces every year. Um, so yeah, you can do it. It, it. And actually, you know, sometimes it's easier that way. You can keep the fertilizer consistent um the ph you don't have to worry about it because it's in the ground you still have some because as we water that ph changes um, because of the alkalinity in our water system but it, it, it's do much easier to do yeah Yes, so um, Miracle Grow is a question we get a lot, and it, it worked great, and it does. It does work in other places. We just have so much salt in our water, and that's, that's where we get our alkalinity, um, is from the salt. Um, so Miracle Grow uses a lot of salt byproducts in their product, and salt and plants don't work and because of that it doesn't work well here so stop using it um, she brought me up this this is flower power this is our miracle growth um, this is a product that we use on flowering plants 
your hanging baskets, this is what you're going to use every two weeks. You just mix it up in a watering can and, and pour it on. Anything that's blooming and you want to continue that bloom, it has a 48 in, as its mental number, and that's all about the bloom. So uh, you can use it on your fruit and vegetables. Um, tomatoes, this increases the bl bl blossoms on the tomatoes as well. Yeah. Flower power. You bet. Grass. So of all of you that need a lawn, I love this guy. I just, I just pet it all the time. Um, but it just makes me happy. I actually have one of these in a pot between my two chairs at, at home, um, just because I need a piece of green. Um, this is the fescue, blue fescue, and it is, it stays this color all winter, um, unless we get super, super cold, and then you'll get a little bit of the brown on it. Um, but it is an evergreen grass, which is unique. Um, so um, you, you can use this in mounds. I usually, when I, I do plantings, I usually do mounds of three of these just because it looks really good that way. Um, but it, it, it's a, just a great ornamental grass and it gives you that pop of color. Lilacs, um, now's the time to get your lilacs. Um, if you are looking for one in your yard, um, this is the bloomerang. The bloomerang is actually a rebloomer, which is really cool. Um, usually lilacs just bloom early in the uh, late spring, early summer, um, and they just, they're done. Um, the bloomerang actually, if you, once it's done blooming, you trim off the buds, and you fertilize it, you should get another set of blossoms late July, August. Um, dark purple, so you get that original color, uh, but great fragrance. And this one stays about six by six, so it's a smaller one as well, so it fits in our yards better. Columbine! <laughs> um, Columbines are a shady plant here, um, so they can take some morning sun, um, but they, they do like that afternoon shade. Um, bloom profusely in the uh, early spring. If you do keep them deadheaded, you can usually later on in the fall, they will come back for you and then they'll, they'll bloom late fall. Um, these are the early bird mix. So they come in a variety of different colors. Um, so they're a great little shade plant. They need a, her question was, is can they take full shade? They do like a little bit of sunshine just to get the photosynthesis happening. But um, if you can give them a couple of hours, they would be much appreciated. Iberius or Candy Tuff is a great little ground cover. Um, he blooms pretty white all spring long. Um, you get a nice two or three foot mound, um, evergreen, which is kind of neat. Um, if you deadhead them after they finish blooming, usually you'll get, you won't, it won't be as profuse, but you will get a second set of blossoms from them. Um, but it's a great little, uh, perennial. This would be deer lunch. <laughs> Unfortunately, these are bunny lunches. Um, the potentia is, is deer proof. Um, lavender, anything that has a, a, a aroma, uh, your sages, your lavenders, your rosemary, all of that stuff. Um, the deer leave alone, um, but um, so there are some things, um, like I said, the, the fescue bunnies will just right to the ground. 
Um, Autumn Sage is another one that's deer proof, rabbit proof. This is pretty much everything proof. So if you're looking for a foolproof plant, this is one of my favorites. Um, the hummingbirds love this. So if you are into hummingbirds, this is the plant for you. Um, this is a, um, it's a salvia, um, autumn sage, we also call it. Um, this is sparkle. Um, it's the pink. We also get ignition purple. There's a white one. There's a coral one. Um, radio red, which is this. There's a hot lips that's red and white. Um, so we have a color to match whatever color scheme that you've got going. Um, most of these get in that three by three size range. Um, bloom from April till November. You can't beat that. Um, so they're really good that way. Um, and like I said, nothing messes with these. Yes, uh, these will grow in a pot. Um, just be careful. I've seen a few come back and then I've asked how often you're watering and it's been like every day or every other day. These are drought tolerant, so they, they do like to dry out in between. So don't overwater these. This is a dianthus or carnation. Um, I just love this color. This is an evergreen perennial, and I don't have too many of those, um, but it, it keeps this color all winter. Obviously, it won't bloom in the wintertime, but um, if you keep cutting the blossoms off, and that's pretty close to everything, all perennials. If you keep deadheading, the blooms will continue. If you let them go to seed, it, it's kind of telling the plant that, the season's over and it's time to, you know, go to sleep. So always deadhead throughout the summer and then leave the seeds later um, as fall comes. And that way, it, if you want the seeds to reseed, you can have it that way. Deadheading is when you take and cut off the, the flower buds. Um, and I usually, I mean, obviously this one has other buds, so you would just pinch off the one that's blooming um, and leave the rest. Um, if it's a single stem flower, you would just take it down to the bottom. Like this one, you wouldn't have to be that precise. You just take it down to like here and, and cut it. What else? Um, I do have fruits and veg or vegetables in. Um, cool, cool season is running rampant right now. So if you're looking to plant lettuces, um, kale, broccoli, that stuff, get it in now. If you wait too much longer, I won't have it and it's going to bolt on you. So it should have been planted early March because um, we're kind of right in the middle of that cool season vegetables. Cool season vegetable, cool vegetable season, sorry. Um, so that that's what you want. Um, I do have tomatoes and peppers um, for those that want to get started early in the house. We do, you don't want to plant that stuff unless the nighttime temperatures are above 45 outdoors. Um, so you can take it in and out if you want to. Um, if you have a sunroom, you could definitely do that. Um, but don't plant it outside and expect it to do well. Okay. All right. Um, plum tree. This is a toka plum. Um, I just thought it was really pretty. Um, pretty white flowers. Uh, the toka plum is a purple plum. It gets about yay big. Um, this is a great pollinator if you like plums. Um, but you would definitely need to have a second plum tree for him. Correct, yes. If you have a plum tree that close, they should pollinate each other for sure. It's, Yeah, so um, you need the same type 
of tree to pollinate. Um, so your plums, pollinate plums, apricots, don't need a pollinator. Uh, your peaches, apricots, nectarines are all self-pollinating. Uh, so you'll only need the one. Um, so, right. So you should be getting your apricots. Um, yeah, yeah, you should be blooming pretty shortly. Perfect, that's awesome. Okay, I got too much stuff over here. Can we just zoom? This is uh, one of my favorite trees as well. This is just an ornamental tree. This is a, a Canada red choke cherry. Um, it is not a fruiting tree, um, but it, it has, it's the leaves start out green and then they turn purple after they come out. So really pretty. It does bloom, um, little white flowers uh, in the spring, um, but a really pretty tree. Um, 20 by 20, it, it, it's kind of pyramidic, uh, a pyramidal uh, shape for you. Um, so it's great for smaller yards. Okay, did I talk about everything? I think I talked about anything. Um, plant protector, um, we've kind of been going on and on about plant protector, but if you have evergreens, um, now's the time to get this on. Um, it protects from uh, bark, uh, bark beetle, pine, uh, pine scale, um, those little dots that you see on your needles, that's scale. Um, aphids are rampant on pine trees. I was at a house the other day and he had aphids all over his tree because um, it was sticky all underneath. Um, so if you get this on um, now, um, this is when the trees are really intaking. So if you have a bug issue on your trees, get this on as soon as you can. Not sure what this is up here, but uh, yield boost booster is again, this is actually almost like a liquid calcium. So if you don't use the calcium nitrate or the gypsum in your uh, pots for your tomatoes, um, this actually you can spray on the flowers and it gives you that boost of calcium on it. So that, it kind of does the same thing as the other stuff. Okay. Since we're talking about bugs, um, cyanara is our insecticide. Um, we, I've seen three little baggies today of roses with aphids in them, so they are out already. You think with the cold that we had a couple, two, three weeks ago, they would have died, um, but no such luck. Um, cyanara is our insecticide. Just mix this up, spray it on, um, and, and that should take care of it. Um, Aphids are basically born pregnant, so you do want to spray every couple, three or four days just to make sure if you miss one, you're, you're still going to have some infestation. So um, every three or four days, just until you know that you've licked it. Um, Thrips are, yes, it works great on bristle, blister beetles as well. Good to know. Um, yes. Yes, you can use the uh, cyanara or the plant protector on the yucca. Um, be careful when you put that on be it, it, because of the blooms. Plant protector has the imacloprid, um, which is the bee killer. Um, so you want to kind of be careful with that with your blooming trees. I always say you can use it after it blooms. Um, I don't know if that will help on the yucca um, or just cut the blossoms off and that way the bees and the hummingbirds that tend to like those won't get infected. Um, I love plant protector, but I don't like to use it on flowering stuff. Um, the cyanara, you could spray that on there um, when you see the aphids and, and like I said, it works really well on them. Um, this is our self-mixing um, hose-in sprayer. 
um, when you guys are setting up your garden shed toolbox, um, always have two sets of sprayers. You want one for your herbicides and one for your insecticide or fungicide. You don't want to mix the two. If you leave any herbicide in that bottle and you go to spray some insect spray on your tomatoes, you just wiped out your tomato crop. Um, so just be careful. I always have them very well marked so you don't mix them up. Um, even washing them out, sometimes you'll leave some residue in there. So be careful with that. Um, this is a great little sprayer. Um, it's self-mixing, so you don't have to mess with it. All you do is set the dial to whatever your instructions say, um, and it mixes in here. So whatever you pour in here, you can actually pour right back into the original bottle. So it's a great little product. Um, and if you clean it out, I, I will say the only time we get these back is it, oh, it clogged. Well, it does have this screen and a tube that goes up here. So you really want to make sure that you clean it out after every use, uh, and it'll last you for you. Uh, dozens of years. Okay, any other questions? Yes. It depends on the bulbs that they're trying to sell. Um, so um, basically your tulip bulbs, your daffodils are fall. Um, the bulbs that are should be out now are like daylilies and things like that, um, gladiolas, that type of thing. And yes, now's the time for that. Yeah. Her question was about birch trees, and yes, you can plant them here. Um, we have several varieties um, that are um, great for here. Um, I actually recommend birch over aspens every day of the week, um, unless you're in a high, high elevation area or you're in a very dense like subdivision where you've got mature trees and stuff to block some of that. We're so dry that the first, three or four years that you have an aspen tree, you're gonna have brown leaves on the edges. Um, and it's just because we do not have humidity and we, we're asking them to live in a high desert area um, where they actually belong in a mountain area. The birches actually give you the same color as the aspens um, and they're, they, they tolerate our, our environment better. So you'll be much happier with the birch. Uh-huh. Uh, her question was Ocotillos, and no. Um, they're a zone eight, so I guess that's a yes and a no. I have seen them around. Um, it depends on where they are located at. Um, I did just get a shipment of cactus, and some of them are in that touchy zone. Um, so if, if you are true gardeners and you want to experiment, definitely do so. Um, this is a great environment to do that. Um, I have a Mediterranean fan palm that's on my back patio that is doing just spectacular, and it is also a zone eight. Um, I do have an advantage, I'm in Dewey, so I'm a little bit warmer, um, but it's in a special location. So it's on the south side, so it gets that full blown to the sun, and it's right next to my house. So I get that extra heat. So I've kind of made a microclimate out of it. So yes, it can be done. Yes. Her question was bougainvilleas, um, about bougainvilleas growing up here. So no, you cannot grow them up here, but I do sell them. Um, I sell them as annuals. Um, so probably late next month, I will get them in. Um, Correct. So they're tropical. So they're, they're going to be a tropical annual for you. Um, it, it, yes, as soon as winter comes, they will die. Unless you give it a haircut and bring it inside. 
it's kind of like the lemon trees. Everybody wants a, a lemon tree up here. It's a house plant. So you can take it outside, enjoy it all summer, and then take it inside and, and enjoy it all winter. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, I, I love Bougainvillea and they have such gorgeous flowers um, and, and they're truly worth it. Um, so fill a pot with them. I mean, and yeah, you're going to lose it, but enjoy them while they're there. You only live once, right? <laughs> yeah. No, uh, so uh, Ocotillos are, are, I believe they're a zone eight, which means that they, they can only take it down to 20 degrees. So anything above 20 degrees is okay. Anything lower, you will want to protect them. So, yeah, and they don't get that cold up there. They do get snow and stuff, but they don't get that. They, they're a totally different zone than we are. Yeah. Yeah, so she, we're, we're back to the bougainvillea. And um, so, yeah, if you're going to bring it in, you, you just want to take it into your house and put it in a bright, sunny window. Um, you will cut it back because if you leave it going, it's going to get really ugly and leggy on you. Um, but cut it back and then it'll be nice and pretty by the time summer comes next year. Yeah. Yeah, they can. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Anything online? All right. Well, I appreciate it. Oh, well, great. I'm glad I could do that. I appreciate you guys all coming out. Um, if you have any other questions individually, I'll be happy to hang out. Thanks for coming. Every Friday, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah.